them. Last thing is if you're new to us, sign up on our clipboards. We're going to have food coming up on January 21st after the service. If you want to eat and get to know us, come in that time. All right. That's it. How you doing, Pastor? Bad? Hey, can we pray for you? <laughs> yeah, you need to. <laughs> hey, we, he's, I, we've all been fighting off some colds. Can we, uh, can we just bless him in the name of Jesus? Let's stand up together. We're, if you're new to us, we like doing this. Um, so we bless you in the name of Jesus. We bless you in the name of Jesus. We bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank we, you. We like you. We like you. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Ryan. Thank you. So we have a little mix-up. You should have in your hand four resolutions for the new year. I like the last sermon, too, about having a happy new year. That was good. But is it everybody, who has this, had uh, four resolutions for the new year? Anybody have that? So how in the world did you guys, you guys must be the enlightened, uh, prophetic ones. And uh, who, who has a happy new year one? What in the world? Whole church got schizophrenia overnight. Okay. So uh, Bob's going to remedy that, and we'll work on that. Bob's in there running off a bunch of copies uh, for the four resolutions for the new year, okay? And hopefully, by God's grace, we'll get them to you. It's kind of important this time uh, to get the outlines done. Bob, make sure you get those and bring them out. We Only about half of us have them, especially because this is sort of a summary thing of our church's values, but also sort of orders for the new year. They're orders that have always been for the church, always and uh, through all the centuries, and uh, so you'll hear some very common themes, but there are also some themes that I've kind of drawn out of Scripture in a way unique to us, maybe unique to our time, and uh, very, very important, I think, uh, for all of us as believers to be pursuing. So this is standard operating fare, although for some of you it might not sound like standard operating fare at all. Maybe you've never been in a church like this or never experienced some of the things we're going to talk about here today. But one thing I talk about a lot, and I'll be doing my life in the spirit class like I always do, uh, here uh, beginning uh, next week, uh, actually it's beginning this week, and I can't wait to do it, and I teach that Life in the Spirit class, you know, week in and week out, I do it right here in the front, and, uh, and then the other classes are various other places, but one thing I always tell them is that we're not a charismatic church, or a Pentecostal church, or because that's a cool thing to do, or that's kind of interesting, the angle, or, or like that's our brand, you know, something like that, uh, we do it because we just find it right out of the revelation of scriptures, so we have this incredible habit of taking the Bible quite literally, <laughs> So whatever we see happening here, we want to do, right? And um, so that's what we do. So, you know, and the Bible is just a weird book. I'm sorry, I, I didn't make it up, you know. I mean, there it is. How about Noah? That's a weird one. Or, you know, how about donkeys speaking and uh, uh, Red Seas parting and people being raised from the dead and leprosy, leprosy disappearing and all kinds of phenomena and things, people walking on water and people uh, calming storms. This is all in the book, right? The question is whether we connect that book with ourselves, ourselves in a very real way. And uh, so that's something we're contending for. We don't always do it perfectly. We always experience what we want to, but that's where we're headed, right? And so these resolutions I want to talk about, four resolutions for the new year, are resolutions that we want to talk about that we, we feel like are the basis of really our New Testament commission and also our New Testament walk uh, with the Lord. So the first resolution for this new year I commit myself to receiving continuous supernatural encounters with God. How about that one? And it's just right from the very beginning. We see it in the New Testament with this uh, Emmanuel, God with us, and Jesus born of a virgin invading the planet. And then Jesus has this interesting conversation. You can see that on A there in your outline as soon as you get it. Uh, anyway, uh, we see Jesus... Uh, talking to Nicodemus, he says, well, you know what, God, you can't really s you sign up for this. You've got to be born again. He says, what do you mean, born again? He says, well, you've got to be born of the Spirit and the flesh. No one can see the kingdom unless they're born again. So he's talking about a radical change, a response by us in the sense of, we want you, Jesus, but on the other side, God's response, okay, I'm going to have to change you. So that's really where salvation starts. It starts with this supernatural encounter with God. So you might not have thought of that. Maybe our culture sort of dumbs that down. But honestly, the difference between a person that walks with God and the one that doesn't is really a supernatural encounter. And a person that gets saved is way different than a person that isn't saved. A person that's really born again has something going on on the inside that's supernatural, that changes them. That's how you become a different person, right? 
And it might come calmly. It might come radically. You might be in a puddle of tears, you know, in the front, or you might do it quite calmly. But still, that change, that supernatural change has to happen on the inside. That's the way we get on with God, right? And it doesn't get any less spectacular as we move on. Matter of fact, Jesus told his disciples to wait and then receive the Holy Spirit, which must have been a little bit puzzling, seeing how, as how the very first day he resurrects from the dead, that night, he breathes on his disciples and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And then 40 days later, he says, you know what? I'd like you guys to wait to be empowered to be what he called baptized, which means immersed in the Holy Spirit. So we read that Acts chapter 1, verses 4 to 8. And so that's exactly what they do. They wait, and then 10 days later, this amazing baptism of the Spirit happens. They get filled with the Holy Spirit. They begin to speak in other tongues, and people all around that are listening to them are shocked because they're hearing them speak in their own languages. So Jesus said, basically, you need to have an encounter because you're not right, ready yet. And when you get that encounter, you're going to have a power that you didn't have before, right? So the, from the get-go, the book starts with supernatural encounters. The central question for every believer in every nation all the time is what we find in Acts 19 when Paul ran across this group of disciples. He runs across this group of disciples, or at least he thought they were believers, and he asked them this question, thinking they were believers, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, well, we hadn't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. And then Paul thought, uh-oh, <laughs> something's wrong here. Uh, I'm not even sure that you guys are born again yet. So he tells them more accurately, they get saved, then what does he do? He promptly lays his hands on them, and they receive the Holy Spirit. And they begin to speak in tongues, just like the earliest believers did. They began to speak in language. They didn't learn there was an empowerment, right? This is the gospel. This is the start of the church. And I don't know about you, I'm not sure exactly how this thing ends up, but I got this feeling that the end of the church is going to be more glorious than even the beginning of the church. It had quite a blast off. But talk about a blast off. I think what we're really looking for is the end of time. At the end, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world, then the end comes. And let me just tell you, as it's being played out, even in front of our eyes, as more power being poured out, more grace being poured out, more amazing miracles and power than we have ever seen in the history of the church right in front of us right now. It's really a glorious time to live, and it's all about continuous supernatural encounters. People in the underground church in China, people in India, people in the farthest reaches of the globe, it's always the same. Somebody gets healed, the whole household gets saved, and then where we go? We do a, a new church in that area. And it's over and over and over again on every continent, every tribe, tongue, and nation. This is what the Lord's been doing and with a special ferocity over the last uh, 30 or so years. It's been incredible. So the <clears throat> question is, really, for us, as we think about our lives, one of the questions we ask all the time here is, have you become a good receiver? Because really, everything is empowered by God. So really, the critical issue in our life is uh, not only that you trust and believe, not only that you hold your doctrinal position uh, correct and you're lining up with what Jesus said uh, in, the, in the Scriptures, but that also that you are open to the Holy Spirit coming and doing something with your life, blowing through your life and making you the witness and the powerful person that you're supposed to be and the loving person, by the way, that you're supposed to be. So on that note, if you look at uh, letter D there under the outline, we bear fruit from our experience with the Holy Spirit. So in these encounters, we bear fruit. So a lot of people uh, give sermons on uh, the fruit of the Spirit, including me, it's one of the most wonderful passages in the Bible. We find this passage in Galatians chapter 5, uh, verses 22 to 25. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And this is a summary of really the Christian life. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. There we see that again. There it is. But keeping in step with the Spirit is not uh, sort of this approach to holiness where we just sort of try to be uh, really good in all the areas and have more patience and forbearance. What really needs to happen is when you encounter the Spirit of God, you encounter all His traits, one of the most dominant of which is love. So you become loving because you feel loved. You give peace because you feel peace. You become forgiven, uh, for, forgiving because you've been forgiven. So it's our experience with the Holy Spirit that actually then causes the fruit to come out in those dimensions. We receive more of Jesus, and then we release 
more of Jesus in all these dimensions. So the question is, are you a good receiver? It's really a critical issue. It's so strange to ask that question, you know, are you good at receiving something supernatural? But that is the key question. And, uh, and so there's various ways that happens. Sometimes the Lord ambushes us, and we receive that way. Some, but more than not, what I do is I just open myself, especially during worship and other times as we're going to see, and just say, God, please come. Come rest on me. It's okay. You can come rest on me. There's no real practical way to teach one, two, three about how you receive the Holy Spirit or how you have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. It's just that, like salvation, if you're open to God and you say, God, I want you, then guess what? You get God. And I'll maybe elaborate a little bit more as I go uh, here just in the next point. But before I leave this one point about the, the fruit of the Spirit, uh, one fruit is a particularly dominant. It's on the list, number one. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love. And one thing that uh, I believe, one of the greatest things that can happen to us is an encounter with the love of God. And so that's why Paul in Ephesians chapter 3 is talking to this mighty church full of good works and doing well. But he noticed that something was eroding. He noticed that they uh, were doing some great stuff, but their love was eroding. It was somehow, and of course we pick this up in the theme uh, back to, uh, about 20, 30 years later, when John says to the Ephesus church uh, by the prophetic word of Jesus, you guys have lost your first love. I like what you're doing. You're doing this, this, and this. You're doing all the things you should, but there's something about your service that doesn't have the same energy, doesn't have the same creativity, doesn't have the same passion and heart. You've lost something. What they lost is the presence of the Spirit. They lost the love of God in the midst of all of that. And so he says, Paul's here praying for them already. We see in Ephesians, even though this letter was written way before that was uh, written by uh, John, but we look at Ephesians 3. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being. There is this theme again. You need to be empowered through his Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, that's the key prayer here, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Wow, what a prayer. You can ask. That's a great thing about this. You can ask for that kind of stuff. Wouldn't it be something to grasp how long and high and deep is the love of Christ? Is that even on the table? Well, you know you got it because this love surpasses knowledge. All the things that we know about God, the information we know about Him, all of it goes way past that, and we get into this place where we really know Him on an intimate level that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So when I get love and I experience love, I am experiencing that I might be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And you think, how in the world could that be? And what is that fullness look like? What could it mean? Well, I just believe that from that place, all kinds of good fruit begins to happen, including power and grace and love and forgiveness and all the rest. Unless you despair of that, Paul returns back to his original subject. Verse 20 says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, because he's thinking, man, how in the world is this ever? These guys must be wondering, how could this happen? How could I have this kind of love? He says, you know what? The one that's able to work in you immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. This power that is at work within us is another way of saying, I need a supernatural encounter with God. It has to hit the ground somewhere. You can talk about it, teach about it, but somewhere or another it has to actually become actuality in a person's life. So there's some pillars of supernatural encounter. And I like to call this, uh, <clears throat> some of the pillars, the very first one, is I call this faith fueled by hunger releasing you into the wildness of God's heart. The first time I ever heard my Presbyterian background, anybody talking about these things, all automatically when they began to talk, I'd never heard such things in my whole life, my heart began to catch on fire. This burning came inside of me. I got, I've been looking for that. I wonder where this is. I see it all through the Bible, but I don't have any experience like this. You mean to tell me you've actually had experience like this? You mean there's actually people who have actually had uh, uh, supernatural encounters with God? And so what was inside of me that I didn't know was I had this incredibly pent-up hunger. And when somebody told me it was possible, faith joined that hunger. And then you know what? At that point, I got released into the wildness of God's heart. What do I mean by the wildness of God's heart? Well, read your Bible. <laughs> What happened to them? It was no calm, tame situation here. It's threatening. It's crazy. It makes you look stupid sometimes and silly. It's wild. We tame God 
way down. We have made them into this little caged person, this lion of the tribe of Judah. We just don't want him to let him out of his cage too much, lest he upset the apple cart and cause too much chaos in our midst. No pastor likes to lose control. No pastor likes to think he's out of control. The church is out of control. But frankly, that's how churches grow. They get out of control. That's the way God moves. Well, where did I get all that? Well, a fair amount of experience now, but actually I got it right out of the Bible. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind. Why wasn't that a little quiet, tiny wind? came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Why would God want to scare everybody? They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire. What in the world are tongues of fire? They separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And why in the world did they begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them? There's other people are hearing them in their language. And by the time those guys got done processing the, the, the whole thing, they said, you know what? These guys must be drunk. So why would God send something that confused everybody and made them think that everybody was drunk? Doesn't seem like a way to start a church to me. But that's not me. That's God, the wild at heart one, right? And they were so hungry, they didn't care which form or a way it came. They just knew. And Peter stands up and says, you know what, guys? Verse 14, uh, I'm sorry, guys, but uh, we're not drunk as you suppose. <laughs> uh, you know, we won't explain this to you. These people are not drunk. Verse 15 of Acts 2, it's only 9 in the morning. No, this is what the prophet, uh, spoken by the prophet Joel in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. This seems a little crazy to me. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and so on and so forth. It just gets wilder and wilder. And then he says, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Why? Because there was an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And we look and we see the character of the early church, which is just uh, uh, so wonderful as you just begin to examine the character, what happened to them. And it's basically summarized in verse 43. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. I want to be a church of awe. It comes with the pride, a little wildness, a little craziness. And you got to be Okay with that, because it's not your show. It's God's show, and he does what he wants, how he wants. And you can cope with that. You can have an encounter with God. And you know what? People that go there are people that have faith fueled by this incessant hunger. They just got to have more of God, wherever it takes them, wherever it leads. And we see, as the story unfolds, and as the church begins to unfold their habits and so on, we see what actually causes this uh, supernatural encounter uh, to be accelerated, what kind of feeds these fires? And uh, so I have four of them here, prayer, communion, worship, and thanksgiving. If we look at Acts chapter 2, 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So the last two of those, the breaking of bread and the prayer, are those two that I have on my outline, prayer and communion. They devoted themselves to prayer and they devoted themselves to communion. The communion is uh, really what we have here uh, when it says the breaking of bread. We're talking about what we just did. So evidently, in that meal is maybe more than some of us experience. See, that communion that we experienced that we just did is like the reset button for all of our faith and our experience with God. God wants to make it abundantly clear that the reason why you get to walk with God in this way, the reason why you get to walk with God in this experiential, amazing way, the reason why you get to have your sins uh, forgiven, the, way you can, the reason why you get to be friends with God and fellowship with God is because he took care of everything at the cross. So through all the centuries, in every tribe, tongue, and nation, every denomination, in various ways, but always to the same point, we celebrate the blood and the body of the Lord. Frankly, I think we are low in the Protestant church on experience with regard to what actually could and what God would like to do at communion. Typically, uh, we're very calm at communion, but I think probably there's far more happening here than we can imagine. God only does this in every worship place on the planet for 20 centuries, something that he's cared that much to attend must have something supernatural about it to make the whole church agree about even though they might not agree about the form, right? And prayer is this other key thing in these, this one verse. They committed themselves, they devoted themselves to be with God, to actually set time aside to pray, to intercede. And prayer is a two-way thing. It's basically communicate, right? 
to God. And as we look at these uh, verses in, in the New Testament church, a couple of my favorites are found here in 1 Thessalonians 5 and also in Ephesians uh, uh, 5. And so I want to just turn to them and just want to read these accounts. And they give us a little hint into the lifestyle of how you keep the fire moving, burning, how to feed uh, fires. I think the most important thing is that you just know there's a Holy Spirit and you're willing to accept and receive Him anytime there's anything uh, going on in your life, whether you're sitting there having tea, wondering if God wants you to minister to somebody, or whether you're in the sanctuary and, and uh, beginning to worship, or whether you're by yourself reading your Bible or whatever. There's always the potential of an encounter. But I found some of these that we see in uh, some of these letters are particularly helpful with regard to this first resolution. First Thessalonians Chapter 5, verse 16. Rejoice always, he says. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That's pretty clear. Rejoice always. So I can rejoice while I'm driving down the road. I can rejoice with the CD. I love to rejoice early in the mornings here in the sanctuary. I spend as much time singing and worshiping as I possibly can, because I think it's what it's referring to. Take a little peek into Revelation and find out what kingdom culture is really about. You want to know what heaven's like? You want to pray down heaven to earth? Find out that in Revelation, that's all they do up there. <laughs> they worship. But when they worship, they're not just singing at God. They're encountering God. That's why everybody's bowing down and worshiping up there and all this. No problem. There's not a discipline of worship. <laughs> they're really having a good time because the presence of God is coming to them while they're ministering to the Lord. He's ministering back. It's that amazing, amazing connection. That's why for me, worship and worship CDs and the whole thing and, and our musicians and everything, someday by God's amazing grace, there'll be 24 hours of worship and prayer going on here. You know what? If I try to get there by discipline, we'll never do it. But if everybody is just so hungry and crazy in love with the Holy Spirit, we will do that. That's why we'll do it. And right, the focus of the whole thing will be Worship, because that's where God lives. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The very next line, do not quench the Holy Spirit. So when you rejoice, pray continually, always have a prayer in your lips, always listening for God, praying, asking uh, for things. Uh, you know, I just always declaring things and changing things and, and listening to testimony, and that's the give thanks in all circumstances. These all fuel one another. So when you find yourself giving thanks for things, you begin to remember what God's done. And when you remember what God's done, you may want to pray for more. <laughs> when you pray for more and see more happen, you want to rejoice. It's all connected. So this rejoicing, praying, thanking uh, atmosphere. And notice the alls here, always, continually, in all circumstances. This is the lifestyle of the believer. It's God's will, and this will not quench the spirit. On the contrary, it will fire up the spirit. It will cause the spirit to exist in your, level, in your life in a level that you never uh, maybe even uh, thought was possible. And I'm just beginning to explore new, new and more territory. Ephesians 5 is very similar. And very similar uh, uh, things it says about this whole subject, this, these pillars of supernatural encounter. Uh, verses 17 to 20. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, if you're drunk, what are you doing? You're living under the influence. You're under the influence of something else. So the whole point is, the Spirit is that something else. You need to live under the influence of the Spirit. And so, in our culture, because of the secular humanism, because of our informational approach to Christianity, we sort of dumb that down to mean, you know, uh, I just need to have a mind that's, you know, uh, saturated in a disciplined way with the Scriptures. That's all true. But I'll tell you what, the Holy Spirit knows the Scriptures really, really well. <laughs> And he has so many new and wonderful applications you never even thought of and such depth, especially in those areas like forgiveness, that we would never have approached. The Spirit of God comes and he leads us into all of those places. And we need to live under the influence of a tangible supernatural presence who will then lead us into the Scriptures. Now, you can read the Scriptures without feeling goosebumps. You know, it's true. And, and sometimes I don't feel goosebumps. But I tell you what, I'm always looking for a sense of the presence of the Lord, whether it's high or low or in between, just some sense of God in my life. So look what he says. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Look what he says. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. We just did that. We were singing, yes, but we were speaking to one another. Right? It's so much more fun for me. You know, I like to worship, but when I'm by myself, it's like, okay. 
But when I'm with another person, it gets better. When I get with 500 people, it's really good, right? So we're not only singing to the Lord, we're singing to each other, and the Spirit is just going from person to person, speaking to one another the psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always, here we go again, giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the same thing again. Speaking, praying, continually being filled with the Holy Spirit, these things. I am a confessed addict, unashamedly, for worship because I find the presence there. I love to pray because I find the presence there. I love to give thanksgiving now. It's a new addition to my life, more than ever before, because I find the Spirit. Wherever I find the Spirit, that's where I want to go, and I'll guarantee you that's where he is, he's at. It's one of the pillars of supernatural encounter, and all of that is fueled by this faith to move into areas and zones with God that may be threatening, maybe even controversial at times. The wildness of God's heart as revealed in the Scripture. I mean, Jesus was wild. I mean... You give him something to eat. He's walking on water, pretending to sleep through storms, <laughs> raising the dead, <laughs> going to Jerusalem when he shouldn't have. That's just him. You want to follow him? That's where we're all going, right? And it's fun. But also, sustaining. It's filling. It's what we always wanted. He's all we wanted, right? He's what we want. So next resolution, I commit myself to hearing and obeying God's voice. Matthew 4.4. 4. This is the revelatory area. And so Jesus is in this place where he's being tempted by the devil. It's, so he's answering the devil back because the tempter says, you know, why don't you, you've been fasting a little bit, why don't you tell these stones to become bread? Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So that's our connection with God too. We need to live and obey whatever he says to do. And so it's interesting. He brings... It is written in there. Scripture is alive and it reveals God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, you know what? This Bible is not just information, it's God breathed. That's why I read it all the time. I constantly, in my Bible, year in and year out, year in and year out. If it's just information, I can't possibly be interested enough to read my Bible. Especially when you get in some weird books like Lamentations and other things like that, right? There's some, a lot of history here, a lot of different cultures and things. But when you realize the whole thing has come down to us and it's, as God breathed, you read it like crazy. You can't stay away from it. Matter of fact, when you start encountering the God of this book in the scriptures, you begin to get crazy ideas. Hey, that's for me. Hey, I need to stop doing that. Hey, I don't want to be like that. Hey, I want to be just like that. I want to experience that. Wow. And you get it from the scriptures because they're alive. And every time you read them, Faith comes in you. If you read it with the right attitude, if you read it just for discipline's sake, to be a good person so God won't mash you, <laughs> or because the pastor said to do it, you're not going to get very far. But if you read it for promise, you're looking for the Spirit on every page. You're looking at this alive thing as something, I'm approaching this book, and it's going to come and devour me. The Lion of the Tribe of Judah is going to come right out of the pages and eat me, <laughs> you know, alive. That's a whole different way, isn't it? And so any new revelation we get, we see in Matthew 4, 4, does not conflict with the Scripture. He says, you know, devil, I can't do that. Because the Bible says, man doesn't live by bread alone, but every word that comes out of the mouth of God, I can't do what you're saying for me to do. It's just not scriptural. <laughs> and it's this wonderful test. And so it's so funny because one of the great delights of my life is when you understand the Spirit and these things and you read in the Bible literally and thinking, I can experience all that. Then when you have these experiences, I tell my class all the time, look, this is just in the Bible. This is what they did. Matter of fact, the Bible is a lot more radical than what they experienced, a lot more radical than anything you see around here, <laughs> right? But I got it from my Bible. So when I have an experience or an encounter, where is it in my Bible? And many times I can find it, or even crazier things, or more amazing things, or unusual things, right? The New Testament age is the age of revelation. Turns out God likes to talk. We see it in Acts chapter 2. The very first sermon. Look what he says. I think the very first sermon that's preached in all of history, it's sort of interesting. Here's what he says. You know what? First of all, guys, we're not drunk. But second of all, I'd like to quote a scripture. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. He's prophesying from Joel. And he says, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Get it? We see visions. We dream dreams. We prophesy. These things are things that the Holy Spirit gives us so we know what God's up to or where he wants us to go. He talks to us through these unusual things. 
These are not unusual to the rest of the world, by the way. Most of the world has a spiritual worldview, so these things have been in their culture for centuries. It's just they've been directed the wrong way. They're trying to get revelation from demons and all kinds of false gods and everything. But the revelatory anointing is something that uh, God has always authored. He likes to talk. Peter is saying, look, guys, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to pour out my spirit. Guess what? I'm going to start talking. <laughs> and I'm going to use you to do it. And I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to talk to you in your dreams. I'm going to give you visions. I'm going to prophesy through you. It's amazing. The New Testament is the age of revelation. It's really nice to know that God likes to talk. Oh, man, our faith just washes up on these shores, and we limit ourselves so much. Just that premise that God likes to talk is a great premise, because sometimes you get in these places, I ain't heard from God in years. Really? I say probably better way to say it is you've been plugged up for years. You have not listened for years. You just had a little construct that in your night, this little neat box that organized God and the way he talks. Remember the one at Wild at Heart? He might not talk like you talk. Matter of fact, if he's the king of the universe, creator of everything, I wouldn't expect him to talk like I talk. Talks how he wants. And then he can come real simply and talk to me in a way that's very understandable. One of the things that's interesting to me about listening to God's voice is I'm always, you know, when I'm trying to listen to him, I certainly listen to him to the impressions that I get from the scriptures. But when I'm trying to hear him for decisions and stuff, what I'm always expecting is like him to speak in a nice, perfect English, maybe a little British accent to sort of make it better, you know. And, uh, and Michael, I would like for you, to, you know, just something, you know, uh, something a little weird, you know, kind of a deep throat thing, you know, not, not too uh, feminine, you know. That's my own thing, you know. All this. I got my ideas of what God's voice sounds like, and it's always sort of in conversational form and everything. And every once in a while he does that, the internal audible voice of God. I've heard that external audible voice of God. Some people have heard that external voice. It doesn't usually too long. It scares you half to death. It's like a sentence or something. But most often, God talks to me, and I can't figure out how he's talking to me. So the only thing that closest I can get to is impression, something like that. Sometimes I ask God, how in the world are you telling me this? I don't hear no sentences. I don't hear any words. I just hear your voice. I just know you're telling me this. How are you doing that? I love to do that. I, I think it's so amazing because he just gets through. He communicates however he wants. You just know it's the Lord. And uh, you can't even figure out how he told you. He just told you, right? Sometimes people say, God spoke to me. He said, well, how did he speak to you? <laughs> you ever had people do that to you? Well, I'm not exactly sure, but I know it was God. That's all I know. I don't know how he does this, you know, <clears throat> right? And so when we look at uh, this lovely God who loves to talk, I, I like this uh, we see in verse 42 again, Acts 2, uh, 42, which is sort of the summary verse. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's that speaking part, right? And the fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. We're going to get to fellowship later, but teaching. But along with teaching was also this amazing uh, revelatory character of the church. We see it on every page. Now, here's an interesting thing about love. Remember the love we talked about? I found out something really interesting about hearing God's voice. Whenever I feel compassion on my heart, I almost always can hear God's voice as well. Have you ever been like, I go to a lot of restaurants, you know, and so I, I think I know every restaurant within 30 miles of here. I've been there, you know, talking with people, being with them, hanging out. So I have this like special sense of waitresses and waiters and people, you know, and what they, you know, kind of just this sort of a fellowship. And every once in a while, I found that the Lord will give me a real compassion for one of them. I don't know how, I just feel compassion. It's like I can see their life. And they're working hard, and I can tell what's in their past, you know. And uh, when I get that compassion, I always know it's a sign that I've got a word for them. And so when I feel compassion, I look for words of knowledge. I look for information that I might have that might help, or I look for a prayer that I could pray over them. And sometimes I'll do that. Because Jesus explained it this way. He says this, very truly, uh, this is John 5, 19. I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. But whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you'll be amazed. Now that word, father loves the son, many of you know it's the word phileo. It's not the agape word, it's the word phileo. It's, it's the demonstrated natural affection. It's the sort of hug. In other words, we could say, for the father hugs the son. He demonstrates his affection. So when I feel God hugging me, I know his words aren't too far behind. I already, matter of fact, when I feel compassion over a situation, over a person, I don't even have to 
ask, really, whether I'm supposed to get involved in that situation in some way. I just know. I follow the compassion. And I found out that some of my greatest words of understanding, greatest words of clarity come when I sense that compassion on the inside of me. It's not the only way. Sometimes I'm just doing it in raw faith without one feeling at all. But I love what God does when he hugs us. He also talks to us. So this commitment to hear God's voice is actually also a commitment to discerning God in everyday life. Turns out this speaking God doesn't just come through prophecy or a certain a scripture. He's always talking. Everything in the whole world talks. God's got is talking through everything. That has been revolutionary in my life. I've heard more of God by understanding that principle. You can find God in your Bible. You can find God in nature. You can find God in our circumstances. We can find God in our encounters with other people. Who you happen to meet on the street, who you happen to run into, you know. Uh, sometimes I'll run into a person on the street uh, from my past or somebody, and I just know it's a divine appointment, and I have to pause. I was just uh, thinking, I don't see her here today, but I just, oh, she was here last night. And uh, somebody had a prophetic word uh, for this lady who ended up into our church, right? And so I ended up outside of Starbucks the other day, and, uh, and while I was, uh, this was, a, this was a, a few months ago, and so while I was out there, you know, at Starbucks, I saw her in her car, and I just knew that that appointment with her uh, was divine. And she recognized me. I didn't recognize her. She said, I've been to your church and da-da-da. And somebody, I, I got to your church because someone prophesied over me in such and such place, you know. <laughs> and that's how I came there. And I was in great need. It was just such a wonderful thing coming to your church and everything. And there she is standing in front of me telling all this thing. And I knew I was on. I knew that was my divine appointment. So I, just say, I didn't just say, oh, that was nice. I just took that, my step back in my little inner ear, and I said, God, what do you have to say? And then I started prophesying to her, tell her what was going to happen for her life. And since that time, it's actually come to pass. It's exactly what I said, it's come to pass. And now her, her, her daughter's coming, and, and you can just feel the, the presence of God in those places. So I don't underestimate when I meet a person, a person that's in a strange setting. I'm just always looking for God in all my circumstances. Turns out, you have to again believe that God's a talking God. If he's a talking God, then he must speak through all kinds of ways, right? And so it's such a joy to me to, to walk with God that way. In all kinds of ways, you know, God speaks and talks. Supernatural guidance comes through various delivery systems. I say delivery systems. One of them is an inner witness. So the more your spirit gets used to walking with God, you, you, you understand when you're getting uh, encouraged to go do something, an inner witness. Sometimes there's a surge of faith. Peter's walking by this guy, and there he is. You know, this lame guy, he's been walking by for years, and he says, you know what? I don't got silver, I don't got gold, but in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Well, he must have had a surge of faith. What happens when you get one of these surges, it sort of bypasses your brain a little bit, because if I were him, I'd been thinking, let's see, I'm going to grab him and pull him up, and wonder if he falls flat on his face. This is going to be very embarrassing. But before he could even think too much, he just grabbed him, pulled him up, and his legs strengthened. That's what a surge of faith does. You don't think too hard about that. You just do it. <laughs> you ever done that and engage someone, you know, and, and you don't know them and you're going to witness to them and you're going, uh-oh, uh-oh, what am I doing? Well, how did I get my, you know? But God will help you navigate those things. Matter of fact, oh, I'm gonna, I'll get ahead of myself. I want to keep moving here. Anyway, faith. And of course, there's the written word of God. Just so many things come and examples and things that remind us of what to do and how to be with God, how to walk with God. Prayer and worship, and matter of fact, one of the reasons why we uh, always pray for people after worship is, I used to do it like way after the service more, but I do it then and after the worship. And the reason why is because for me, worship stirs up the presence of God. And in that worship, I begin to hear things from God. And I think that's the best way to actually then release words of knowledge because you've been worshiping and the presence of God's everywhere. And it's much easier to get words of revelation of what God wants to do in the meeting right after the worship than to wait. So that's why I like to sort of dive in because after prayer times and worship times, I, I hear God's voice. When I turn and I, I'm attentive to him, I hear his voice. Third resolution, I commit myself to God's cause in the earth. This one is a little bit different movement in the spirit. This one's done on purpose. And sometimes there's not a single goosebumps. You just do it anyway because of this general directive word that we heard from Jesus that applies all the way through 20 centuries of church history. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So we purposely 
release God's kingdom, his authority into the world with supernatural power and prayer, power, and revelation. And you know what? One of the reasons why we're doing it is because it's an eschatological, which is a fancy word of saying, it's an end time thing too, especially these days. Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world and then the end shall come. So I tell you often, this is more true now than ever. I think Paul would have been so shocked if somebody from the future were to come back to him and said, you know what, there's about 800 million believers, born again, true believers on the earth. And if you told him at the same time, guess what, there's only 400 million people alive right now in your time. There will be a time in the future where there will be 800 million. Twice the number of people alive on the whole planet will all be Bible-believing Christians. There's about 2 billion that think of themselves as Christians, but in terms of really being believers, there's that many. And it's increasing. It's going crazy out there. It's so wonderful. This gospel of the kingdom is being preached every continent, tribe, tongue, and nation on a level we've never seen before. So this is being fulfilled in front of our very eyes in very, in very distant nations and places. So the thing is about this cause in the earth, which actually I believe culminates somehow in the end times, the very end of time, we purposely release God's authority, but we do it like the Jesus way. So many of us love to pray, so we say, come to that part of the prayer, our Father who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We say it like a poem. But that prayer is an invasive, crazy prayer. I'm asking God to invade. Lord, invade that space. Invade Mission Viejo. Invade Laguna Niguel. I want you to change things. You know, and oh my goodness, I just want to, I'm just going to get on my hobby horse here a little bit. We are so passive. It does not line up with this God's uh, 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 concern for us to be involved in his cause. When fires are burning in California, that's your cause. That's when you declare thy kingdom come. Lord, shut those fires off. And when there's not enough rain, Lord, your kingdom come. Do something different now. It needs to change. The atmosphere is not right. When there's crime in the streets, Lord, I don't want make this a crime-free zone. No acts of terror on our watch. And we're watching and declaring. I just encourage you, pray over your government. If you ever prayed over your government, pray over it now. Your kingdom come in the government. We need new judges. We need new legislatures. We need everything. Well, we need change. God, thy kingdom come. That's the first place where we commit ourselves to God's cause. We pray the things that are in God's heart. God, bring evangelism to Iran. Convert that whole thing. Overthrow those governments and bring the government of God. Oh, my goodness. This is what our heritage is. Some of us are so lazy and have no faith whatsoever. We're not committed to God's cause. We can't even utter those words. We didn't even think we're supposed to utter those words. You know what I do? I do ridiculous things. I pray that there be no accidents on the 405 and the 5 freeway out here. I say, no, Lord, no accidents on our... No, I, I even stipulate, no, no accidents from Irvine to uh, San Clemente. No, no, Lord, a gang activity, no violence from Irvine to San Clemente, Saddleback to the sea. This is our territory. None. No fires? There were no fires, right? Were there any fires in Orange County during this whole season? I don't think so. Very little. We had one little tiny one right around the corner. And I was so happy. It just got burned out just as fast as it started. We got it, right? I think I'm responsible for that. I don't know. It's kind of crazy, but... And every once in a while, I'll take a little credit for it, you know, when something good happens, right? <laughs> That's why I say we, we, we purposely release God's authority to the world with supernatural prayer and power. My goodness. John, when this great commission that we all talk about, here's how it went down with those disciples. This is what Jesus said to do, you know. He not told them to proclaim. He said, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Now prove it. I'm going to prove it. This is why you've got to know that God's here. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you have received, freely given. The truth of the matter is, as salt of the earth, when you walk in the door to any restaurant, any house, any place here, the kingdom of God just walked in the door. The question is whether you're going to release the kingdom of God or not. Are you going to let God do those things for you? That's part of our heritage. That's part of what we do. We need to commit ourselves. And sometimes we don't feel like doing that stuff. Matter of fact, most of the time we feel really small and insignificant. But in even those feelings, if we'll take a step and just say, listen, I don't care. I'm committed to this cause. If I see a purpose person limping down the street, I'm going to go catch up with them and pray for their leg. If I see somebody that's not doing well and crying, I'm going to put my arm around them and comfort them. Their cause is my cause. When they're not doing well, I'm, I'm the answer. That's what we're saying here. I commit myself to God's cause in the earth. I can get revelation. I can get insight. 
God wants to use me. I'm a part of the whole process. That's why Colossians 4, 2 to 6 says, you know what? Make the most of every single opportunity that you get in your life. Make the most of every opportunity, right? We are God's bold witnesses in the world. Matter of fact, sometimes our boldness sort of winds down. As the church began to grow and expand, all of a sudden, Peter and John get arrested. And everybody's thinking, uh-oh, <laughs> we've been doing pretty good, but now they got arrested. What are we going to do now? I, I love this. I think it's the turning point in Acts. I think it's got to be one of the keys uh, of the turning point in Acts. You know what they did after they got arrested and that Peter and John then got, got um, brought back to them? They said, oh, man, you delivered them. Okay, Lord, here we go. From now on, I don't care what happens. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal. Perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Evidently, God likes boldness. <laughs> they asked for it. They knew. Okay. Hey, there's a line in the dirt here. It might cost us our life, but we're going to be bold. We're committed to your cause, Jesus. We've been waning a little bit. We're a little afraid when John got arrested. But, Lord, we know we can't be that anymore. We are committed to your cause. No matter what they get arrested or we get arrested, no matter what, we're not turning back. We're moving forward, right? And that's the kind of commitment God's looking for us. When we don't feel bold, we can pray for boldness. But it's the normal thing to be bold. It's a normal thing to be invasive in people's life, even strangers' lives. It's a normal thing. I don't mean be obnoxious when I say invasive. I just mean that you can get into people's lives much more easily than I ever thought. One thing you can do is just talk to them. <laughs> just talk to them. Just talk to a person. When you get talking with a person, before you know it, you're talking about stuff. When you have this conversation or report, you, it's amazing if you're looking for where God will take you, right? So I'm committing myself to boldness in the earth. We're also committed to being givers. That's why we're bold. We're givers first, yet expecting to reap an abundance from the Lord. We look at Acts chapter 4 in this church. It's amazing. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. And that's just in the church. We're givers. Commit yourself to being a giver. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. It's just a normal kingdom lifestyle. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul's so proud and he helps us understand who we are as believers. This movement out of committing ourselves to God's cause. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. God does giving. And he wants a cheerful giver, <clears throat> maybe even like maybe witnessing or sharing, maybe you don't feel so great about that. But I'm telling you what, with this incredible testimony, uh, John Norton was here and he was talking about <laughs> some things that had happened to him that were negative in terms of his finances. And he says, you know, but one thing, ever since Jack Deere came, some of you remember that, Jack Deere came years ago, he says, I have started tithing, I, ne I never stopped. He says, it's amazing. It doesn't even matter how much money I lose or where I go, you know, in the stock market, whatever. I always seem to have more than enough. I always bounce back. God somehow multiplies it back to me. I found out I can't outgive God. I've made it a pillar of my life. Whatever I do, I'm going to be generous, and it starts with a tenth of my income to God all the time. And you know what? He wasn't, like, feeling compulsion. He was pretty happy about it because he sees the result because God is able to bless you abundantly so that all things, is this like, like, if you read these words, it's just incredible. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you'll abound in every good work. That about settles it, doesn't it? <laughs> what else is left to say? He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity results in thanksgiving to God. And the setting of this is they were going to give an offering to the poor in Jerusalem. This is normal kingdom fair. I commit myself to God's cause and the earth. We make the world taste good. <laughs> we act like Jesus toward the weak of the world. I'm so happy about our commitment to the poor in this area. I just, golly, me, me and Kent walked out the door this morning, and I'm looking over there. We got this accountant in our church, just such an amazing person. And there he goes with his van, backing it up into our warehouse, getting food out of there, and he's going to go buy some more. He's set every single weekend of the year, that guy goes up to Santa Ana with a team, and they deliver food to the poor in Santa Ana. 
and this kind of activity. But we don't only do the, the we feed people here in our warehouse, but we're, that, that warehouse is like, a, like, it's like the Garden of Eden. It just keeps flowing food out in every direction. It isn't just there. It's going to a place. I don't even know how many places it goes out to. Maybe John could tell me, but five, six, seven places. It's always going out to little places, big places all over, and also to the people who come here. It's amazing. That's normal kingdom activity. This is what we see with Jesus. Jesus quoted this passage at the beginning of his ministry. This is what he said. This is his description. But I want this to be my description. How about you? I want it to be your description. Listen to this. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. That's why we do so much mission stuff. The poor out there, the poor in these places and highways, byways of the world, there's no ladder to climb out. They're stuck in the worst horrible cesspools of humanity you can imagine. So we have as a commitment, it's the commitment of Jesus, it's, it's God's cause. Whatever you do, make sure you preach the gospel of the poor. That's why we've seen several thousand people give their heart to Christ in the warehouse over the last several years. That's why we've seen people pray to receive healing, 2,000 healing. When we commit ourselves to the poor, God commits himself to us, and he brings these signs, these wonders, these amazing miracles. I'll always want to be committed in this direction. It's good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up who? The brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They'll be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. I want to be an oak. How about you guys? I want to be an oak. <laughs> and I want to do this stuff. I want to, I want to, wherever there's weakness, I want us to be a church that finds the weakness, no matter what it is. Whether it's comforting Sue over there, who just lost her husband a couple of weeks ago. Or whether it's comforting Alvin Rodriguez, who lost his mother yesterday. Or our dear sister here on the wonderful front row, our prophetic voice in our community who lost her father. Those places. And every other place where people are weak, brokenhearted, in a place of despair. That's our job description. I want to be like that. How about that? I commit myself to God's cause on the earth because that's where he's living. That's where he goes, right? The last point. I commit myself to having clear personal relationships and to a broader Christian community where God is revealed and experienced. God gives us a specific place and people to give and to receive from. So when we look at this unfolding of the early church, we see a, 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 like a pattern or a template. I love this template. I love to review it all the time because that's the kind of church I want to be. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So now we're moving on to this value of fellowship. We just got through with teaching and fellowship and breaking the bread of prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. That's that God's cause on the earth. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together. Here's an interesting thing. In the temple courts, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So in the homes too, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. There's that impact in the world. But God gives us a specific place and specific people to commit ourselves to to see this plan happen, Right? And so we see it has, actually has uh, two dimensions. There's the public settings, and then there's the smaller, more intimate places. I call that 2020 vision. In Acts 20, Paul says, you know, I haven't hesitated to preach anything to you publicly and from house to house. So that kind of fellowship is so important. We commit ourselves. They devote themselves, the apostles teaching, and to fellowship, to belonging somewhere. Above all, we love by serving, honoring, and forgiving each other. And one of the greatest things that we can do for one another is forgive each other, even when we've been misused. And I want to read out of Romans. There's two great passages, but I'll just read out of Romans 12 to give us a sense of this. It's so important that we come together. There's someone we identify with, a group of people we identify, and we walk our walk out with them in, their, in the context of somebody else, both in the larger gathering like we gather today and also smaller gatherings of Bible studies and, and twos and threes where we gather together. Matter of fact, it only takes two or three to gather together. God's presence is there. You can bind and loose from that space. Never underestimate the power of fellowship. I'm beginning to realize more and more, I am not alone. I feed off the church, and the church feeds off of me. I live off the anointing of the church, and then I give my anointing to the church. And before, we are better together, aren't we, as a community, as a group. And we forget that, we become liable. We become actually in a dangerous position because the warfare that's going around and around us is so severe. We need the group. Lions 
Devils, the Bible says the, the devil's like a lion roaring around looking for someone to devour. Guess what? They never try to devour a whole herd. They always try to get you alone and then hammer you. There's a power of protection. Have you ever noticed how much better you feel when you come into the assembly and worship? It's not because everybody has good voice. I'll tell you why. Demons hate this place. They stand at the door and say, I'm not going in that place. There's angels and all kinds of stuff in there. I ain't going in there. Some angel might torch me. I don't want to be in there, you know. So they wait for you to leave, right? But you can carry that fellowship because, yeah, man, by the way, we got these little phone things. You can text. You can call. You can communicate better with others now than ever before. Don't walk alone. Walk in small groups and walk in big ones, but all of it is a part of our resolution. We have to commit ourselves to fellowship. And so what happens is something like happens in, we read in Romans chapter 12, and I'm drawing this to a close. Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Do you need a place to do that? That's just like Jesus. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. That's how you keep your zeal, by the way. It is really hard to keep your zeal alone. It is really hard. And some of us try it. Some of us go on whole months and two months and three months trying it, and we can't figure out why we feel so restless, and you just don't understand. You derive part of your life from, the, from others. You can't live without others. I don't care if you got the flu, you know, for a couple of weeks, then don't use that as an excuse to go three or four more weeks without being around people. You've got to be around people. It's really important. It's your survival. It's basic Bible 101. It's basic resolution. It's basic things that we need to do. We have to have clear personal relationships, places where we can commit to, and people can watch our back and we watch other people's backs. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. That's that relational thing. So we have a whole class called Thrive. And that class is committed to making sure you don't do this very thing. <laughs> that you keep your eyes clear relationally. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That word right there is a dramatic word. Is it dependent on you? Be at peace with everyone. And sometimes it is dependent on you. Sometimes God wants you to ask for forgiveness or give forgiveness or Try to take that next step. Don't take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And by the way, evil just doesn't come like in a nice package that says evil like when the person walks in the door, right? It's usually some of those that are closest to us, that disappoint us, that discourage us, that make the stupidest decisions, that say evil about us, and they were our best friend, or they were our close friend, somebody we loved, and then they start doing bad things. Well, it's so important that we commit ourselves to be clear of that, insofar as it's dependent on us, and don't hold grudges, don't hold that place. And together we create a safe place in the world. And I'll just finish with this Ecclesiastes chapter 4. It's an Old Testament word, but it has incredible relevance, maybe more than ever before. Because I watch people do this so much. They get isolated, they get alone, and they get hammered. And they can't understand the spiritual dynamics about it. Even just the play, being with a corporate group of people, committing yourself to them, just being in the place, there's safety in numbers. That's why Ecclesiastes says this. He says, you know what? Two are better than one because they've got a good return for the labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Oh, my goodness. I see this every day in the warehouse. People that have fallen and there's no one alive, no one there to help them. Oh my goodness, this is the story of our time. My mind. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. The cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Where is that third strand? That's Jesus Christ in our fellowship helping us, right? Us praying together in twos and threes and fending off the darkness and the power that, that try to devour us. Amen? Four resolutions. Let's stand up. Lord, we resolve our ways. We resolve ourselves to these areas. We want to be about your, your ways, Lord. We want to commit ourselves to supernatural encounters. We want to hear your voice and obey. We want to commit ourselves to your cause on the earth, and we want to commit ourselves to having great relationships and being a part of a loving, thriving community and adding our gifts to it and receiving back. Lord, I pray that over us in this new year. May all these things I said and all the subpoints be even more dramatic than we've ever experienced before in our life. So, you know what? 
can't preach a message like this without having a supernatural encounter. You know, in a message like this, whenever faith goes out and the word's heard and it's preached, there's always something else. There's always a response. And often in response to words that are preached are some of our best stuff. God happens because faith arises, and when God sees faith, down comes the power. And uh, I just have this word that I would like to just share for today as a response. Some of us have been stuck a little bit, just stuck. And we don't, you know, it might not be a horribly serious thing, or it might be a serious thing. But I believe that today is a day to get unstuck. Could I just give some categories? And I'm just going to invite you in a moment to come and uh, pray up here at the front. And maybe someone in the fellowship will be committed to come over and stand by you and pray with you. All right? And so here's a couple of things. Maybe you're stuck in your job and you're coming this new year and you have no idea what you're going to do and you know you're going to need provision. Maybe you're stuck with something that will not be healed in your body and just keeps coming back again and you need a breakthrough. Maybe someone here needs a, a breakthrough in a relationship. Maybe there's a loved one that just uh, has gone astray, maybe from the Lord. Maybe there's someone that you're crosswise with and you just desperately want that thing to be fixed. There's all kinds of things, all kinds of positions in this church, but I just want to tell you today, if we can respond today, God wants to intervene. And just by simply crying out to Him and asking Him for an encounter, sometimes God will touch us up here and just heal us on the inside. Sometimes He'll give us an anointing to pray uh, for our situation together, whatever it is. But I just want to invite you to an encounter with the Lord. So if you would like to have that in these brief moments while we're doing worship, come forward right where you are from right now. We're just going to ask heaven to come down on you. We're going to ask heaven to change not only your inner life, but also your outer life and change the circumstances. Lord, I just give this invitation. Father, I pray as we come in faith, I pray, God, you would ambush us. I pray you would touch people on the outside of us. We pray you would touch us today. Maybe someone came in here feeling especially lonely and just maybe despairing. I'm asking you, Father, as we pray for each other, that you would just release kingdom love. Lord, and I pray you would release it to us. I pray in this room, this moment, as we minister and worship, pray for one another, you would bring kingdom hope. Some of us are just hopeless. We just need hope. Lord, stir us up on the inside. Some of us just need Jesus Christ. We never really have fully committed. We've talked about God. We never really committed to God. And maybe we've never even been born again. We don't even know what that means, but we want it. Just come, wherever you are. This table's open. There's something here for everyone because God's in this place. Lord, we pray the angels of God would come over this place. I pray your ring of protection would be around us. We pray, Lord, for healing. Again and again, Lord, we ask God to break through in our circumstances. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, your lovely voice is one of the most wonderful things. Would you just talk to people today as they're standing there in worship? Would you just speak in their other ear and tell them it's going to be okay? Would you give them wisdom and counsel for difficult circumstances even today? Would you just come today? Would you rearrange things today? I declare, Jesus Christ, you are alive and well, and you like to talk. So I pray, Lord, you give us a talking to today. Strengthen where we're weak. Encourage us, Lord. And bless our loved ones and all around us and our families in Jesus' name. So if I have some people come, maybe you'd like to come and help minister a little bit on the ministry team. Just pray for people. I'm just going to spend a little time doing that with you just to Clear things. You might want to ask a friend what's going on with them. Or just come up, just put your hand on someone, just pray a blessing over them today. Amen.